compression or reduced compression? Um, it's being, well, that's one of the things we're looking at. Um, um, producer gas is a very interesting fuel. It's incredibly detonation resistant, has a very high auto ignition temperature. Um, it appears to be able to run up to about 17 to 1 compression. Um, it is, it, it burns incredibly cleanly because it is the most simple carbon and hydrogen gas. CO is the most simple form. You can have carbon exist as a gas, it won't exist as just C. Um, H2 is about as simple as you can get a hydrogen based gas because it is just hydrogen. So, in some ways, you can think as a gasifier as a big pre combustor that does all the hard work of breaking down all the big hydrocarbon molecules into the most simple carbon and hydrogen gases. And then those go into the engine, and they take one oxygen for each of those molecules, and it goes to the end state of combustion. So it's very different than like a gasoline or diesel engine where you're putting this huge molecule in there. In the case of diesel, it's like C23H46 or something. And so there's a whole series of pyrolysis events where you're, you're fragmenting that, 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 um, that molecule down, and various radical processes are happening. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to go on very, very quickly, and it doesn't finish, which is why we get, uh, or it's difficult to make it finish, which is why we have all the exotic things going on in comb combustion engineering and why we have emissions issues. So, aside from ga gas fires um, being a difficult problem, when you have them working well, they have this very interesting, essentially pre-combustor character that gets the gas into this most simple form that you take into the engine. So, the, the emissions out of them are very clean. Okay. Did you get that get it running with the turbo generator? With the capstone? No, we've actually never run that. <laughs> we should, but it's it's another project. We have too many projects, and so we have to survive. So we, we have to work on the things that are going to produce something that's meaningful to take out out in the world. And I mean, the capstone's fun and sexy, but it, it, it's meaningless as a deployment machine. Um, it's a beautiful piece of engineering. Um, it's a catastrophe of economics, um, not a catastrophe. It, it didn't work out that well. Um, but they were great at press releases. They were, they were great at their IPO. Um, they, they juiced the stock, the, the stock price really well. Uh, it, it became, it was a, Capstone turned into a very um, uh, exotic financial event that, that didn't really produce much on the ground. Okay. But they're great machines, so we wanted one. I mean, it's a masterpiece of engineering. Do your uh, producer gas diesels run lean of peak, so you can actually go really run rich of peak? Sorry, what? Do they need to run rich of peak or lean of peak? Um, they can run lean of peak because the, the, the fuel is, is a very unenergy dense fuel. Now, how lean of peak it can run, we don't know. In general, both carbon monoxide and hydrogen have, have very wide flammability limits, so much wider than your other typical fuels. That's the other thing that's attractive about this fuel is, in principle, you can, you can run them in, you know, in, in very unusual combustion regimes that other fuels wouldn't, wouldn't fire. Now, what it actually is, given once you've added the nitrogen dilution into it, I can't get good numbers on that. Okay, but you know, hydrogen like has a flammability limit of like, is it five percent to eighty percent or something? Ninety percent? It's huge. Okay. Um, you know, we often hear well, wood gas has a very slow frank flame front, has all these problems. It can't. It can't High, high RPM, that comes from the carbon monoxide. Actually, it doesn't come from the carbon monoxide. The slow flame front is from the nitrogen dilution. Um, the flame front is a, it's a heat transfer problem. Um, and so when you dilute it with a bunch of stuff, that you're increasing the amount of mass it has to go through for us usable chemical reaction. So it's the nitrogen in it that really causes the slow flame front. Um, and Carbon monoxide has a, a flame front speed that's slightly above propane, but basically equivalent. And the hydrogen is, of course, very, very fast. So the hydrogen is really what saves this. If you didn't have the hydrogen, it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, but a lot, one of the things we get with all this extensive heat recycling work we do is we add so much heat back into the reactor that we have to do less um, combustion events internally in it, so we get less, a little bit less nitrogen dilution. Now, how far is that going to go? We don't, we don't really, really know yet. But it's not an, a full indirect gasification regime, but we are making some progress in there. So when we finally have gas analysis equipment in-house, so we can start characterizing this a bit. And one of the reasons we're, we've done all of this heat recycling work is to create enough thermal headroom in the reactor that you can start adding water back into the reactor and not overwhelm your temperatures 
um, in the combustion zone, and that added water. If I actually get to my gasification lecture here, I'll show you why that can incre increase your, your, um, your hydrogen CO output. I'm going to go through the technology tomorrow morning. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to do that a high level intro like that. I have Yahui do his, his introduction, and a lot of you have just flown in from out of town, so uh, we don't want to go to midnight tonight. Okay? So I'm going to do a short talk on the technology of gasification. Uh, well, gasification is uh, the operating system of fire. We're going to go through how gasification is a series of sub processes or sub routines um, that are happening under the hood of fire. Uh, fire is a meta phenomenon. Um, but underneath it, there's, there's four discrete processes that we pull apart and can control in gasification um, and so that we can control the, the ends produced other than uh, just a general campfire. And to understand those four processes, uh, you can take biomass to a variety of, of end products um, as you control. Okay? So I'm going to try to do that as quickly as possible. Um, then we are going to do a round robin where we take uh, 15 minutes at each of the five projects or tracks that we're doing, go around and introduce those, and then the rest of the day we'll be building um, and operating those tracks. Most all of the tracks today are going to be um, doing finished assembly, configuration, instrumentation, and whatnot, walk you through all the issues of, of how, the, how we actually realize these machines in the world. Uh, we'll do some running today of power pallet and the back. Um, and hopefully the Lister, but most of the day is going to be spent still um, building and noodling on those. And then throughout the day, there's also going to be some talks. Um, we have two talks today. Uh, and we're not going to formally stop the, the projects to have those talks. So if people decide whether you want to work on the projects or go to the talks and um, wander around as you like. Okay? The projects or tracks are going on simultaneously, so you go wherever you want. So, they will go on all today, tomorrow, and Monday. And then the Power Palace project, um, we're stepping towards this 24-7 run. Um, so again, today is the configuration, uh, final configuration of the machine, as well as setting up the instrumentation. The instrumentation is um, surprisingly complicated. It's probably more complicated to operate than making the machine work. Um, so it's, it takes a while to get that, all that in order. Um, We'll run it for several hours today on and off. Tomorrow we'll run it all day. Um, Monday it's unclear what we're going to do, but by Tuesday, <laughs> actually I think Monday we'll start the 24-7 run. That's the notion that it continues from there. Okay? So, there's that. That's the outline for today. Um, any, any questions before I get going on this? What are the two talks on today? Um, at 1 o'clock we have Andrew from Berkeley PhD student, um, Berkeley is doing a, a, a talk reviewing the literature of um, biochar's impact on plant performance, what we know today. So it was a summary talk on all the different um, 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 variables and dynamics of, of uh, plant processes that get impacted by, by, by biochar. Okay? And then at 3 o'clock, we have the students from Laguna Creek High School reporting on their uh, Green Academy uh, energy group, which they have a shockingly impressive um, array of, of energy pro projects that they build and operate. Um, I have nothing like this in my high school. Where is Laguna Creek High School? I'm interested. Elk Grove, just uh, south of Sacramento. Okay. So, and they just got a GEC, um, which they're I think they're still assembling. You guys haven't even got it all, all together yet, right? So, okay. So, I mean, they're really going to report on the other stuff they're doing from the very neat. And then tomorrow, the, tomorrow is the main biochar day. It's when Kelpie's talking, uh, Local Brunes, and Jim Fournier. Chip, you want to talk to? Maybe. Okay. Um, so, um, and then we have the, the biochar garden project in the morning. Um, the community garden in Berkeley is going to start doing some biochar work. So. We have to make some biochar today so we can give it to them tomorrow. So we have to get the deck running today. Okay? No pressure. No pressure. Well, it's close. It's close. What? The garden thing tomorrow? Yeah, that's at 10 a.m. The specifics on that, I actually don't know. You should ask um, Rachel or, 
or um, Ariel. And the people that will be around assembling the Beck today uh, know the details. Okay? Okay, anything else? Or shall we go here? Nothing else? Okay, down the rabbit hole, gasification basics. So, here's all the pathways of uh, biomass energy conversion. Um, we're going to be playing with three of these this weekend, but I wanted to give you the general overview of all of the possible ways in which we can take the products of solar energy, carbon dioxide, and water, which we know come together to produce biomass, um, a carbon-based carbon molecule, um, rather energy dense. Um, what are the, the various pathways that we can convert that into various useful products? Um, I, I became very interested in biomass um, energy when I really saw that it wasn't just energy. You could actually take this, this carbon-based molecule and use it for energy purposes, but it was also a replacement for the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms that we use to make all sorts of um, physical products in the petrochemical world. So we can, make, we can use it as a feedstock to make liquid fuels. We can use it as a feedstock to make fertilizers. Um, we now we see we can make biochar out of it. So there's a broad range of both power and products that the raw biomass um, can be, can be um, transformed into. And, and this, this creates the potential for these multimodal platforms where we take a very biomass as we find it in the areas where we're working, take it through a, a, a converting machine and have outputs, um, diverse outputs um, across power, fertilizers, fuels, and other potential products like heat and shaft power. Okay? So it, it gives you diverse potentials very different than PV where you have one output, you have electricity output. And really what we're trying to replace here in our current energy situation isn't electricity, it's all of the various things we do with the carbon and hydrogen and oxygen atoms that are coming out of the fossil fuels. Okay? So we, even if we had a total PV solution um, for electricity, we still have a need for all of the products and transformations that we do with the, the raw carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay? So here's all of the various pathways that you can run biomass through um, to get to these diverse power and product ends. Um, the chart here divides it between the wet processes and the thermal processes. Um, the wet processes are direct extraction, it's like rubber and resins. Digestion is the one we probably most typically know popularly, that is the anaerobic digestion um, through bacteria. Um, of course, we have uh, uh, fermentation and distillation, which is our, our alcohol processes, and all of the uh, recent ethanol distortions, of common sense. Um, so, with working with some sort of wet biomass process, like a you know, dairy outlet or something, um, the, the difficulty of drying that fuel to take it through a, a thermal process is very extreme. Um, it takes a lot of energy to get the water out of the system, so it typically makes sense to choose a process that can work wet. So you don't have to deal with the drying stuff. If you, if you have a dry fuel, um, there's a variety of, pro of, of thermal processes that are, are better fitted to that, that fuel. Okay? And we see here, why does my cursor keep this Whoops. And the chart here has them as gasification, pyrolysis, pyrolysis, liquefaction, and combustion. And there's a variety of kind of hybrids and different flavors of these. But most all of the, the thermal oxidating processes um, fit loosely within these categories. Okay. Um, during our weekend, we're only running dry processes. We currently aren't working with any of the wet processes. Um, and we're going to be running... I'm doing well on this one. We're going to be running um, an air-blown gasification pro process to low BTU gas, and then running a liquefaction project on that to up, up migrate that to liquids. Okay? The Beck is going to be running a pyrolysis process primarily for the, the charcoal output, um, but there's also a condensing coil on it to get the bio oil off of it. Um, 